God promises a royal throne to Solomon, and if he stays faithful to God, he will suspend that for many, many years. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery as we go through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Today, we're going to study 1 Kings chapter 9. This is very interesting. Corey and Ryan are here. Corey, what's going on? Well, I'm going to be talking about the physical throne of King Solomon as described in 1 Kings chapter 10. It was quite showy. Ryan? Well, today I'm looking at the life of King David's son, Solomon. And Solomon had a great beginning, but eventually turned away from the Lord. Yeah, he did. He deviated a lot. Anyway, what are you doing? Today, the cornerstone. All right, so take your Bible guide and let's turn to today's passage in the Bible, the most important book of all. And uh, if you don't have your Bible guide, we'll tell you how you can get one in just a moment. And let's read and listen to what God says. First Kings 9, 1 through 9. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have embraced other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Well, we continue going through Kings. This is really something. First Kings 8 to 10, as we focus on this, we're kind of dealing with Solomon. And Solomon reigned in the golden age of Israel. Now the nation became wealthy and powerful under his leadership, but he became distracted and worshiped other gods. He was taken off course by the women he married because in the ancient royal marriages, the husband swears allegiance to the wife's religion. Now, that is the cultural identity of where she was from. Now, the Bible tells us that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. First Kings 11, 3. Now, listen, I don't know about you, but that's a lot. Now, God had told the nation, as well as the king of Israel, that if they were not careful, they would fall astray and worship other gods. Actually, that's exactly what happened to King Solomon. But remember that God had made clear to Israel and to Solomon the standards a king must uphold to assure the success of his reign. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17 says, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be, 
when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in the book from one before the priest, the Levites. Now, this was the downfall of Solomon. And we understand that by neglecting God's word, he clearly went off track. And that's very, very important. As we focus on this, I want you to take your Bible guide and turn to it. It's really important um, to listen to the word of God. And let me say that if you don't have a Bible guide, you can call us or write to us. We'd love to send you one. Thank you for the donations that help us do that. Another way you can get it seconds away from it is simply go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com or BibleDiscoveryGuide.com, either one, and you click on the Bible Guide, it takes you to a donate page. Thank you for your donations. Then it takes you to a place where you can download it exactly how we printed it so you can follow us. But what the Bible Guide does is open up the most important word of all. That's the, it's the, the most critical thing you will ever read in your life is the Bible. 66 books from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's promise of a blessing and everything else. That's the most important thing you'll read. And today we need to pray. Father, I pray as we study these nine verses in chapter nine, that you would help us to hear you. We need to hear what the Holy Spirit says to us. So thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now let's focus on this because it's important. The scripture says, and it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desired, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house, which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, if this is the important part, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, then if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David, your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. There it is. You see, God promised Solomon a royal throne over Israel forever, conditional to his obedience to the Lord. Now listen to me carefully. God desires our obedience to his word. Worship him alone. Worship God alone alone. That is so important. You know, the second commandment says, don't make idols and put them up. Worship me. Now that's important. God is not, you know, he doesn't, he, he's not, he's not an egotistical, but worshiping God brings us on the right path. That's what we need to remember. Now let's go on because this is really, really good. The scripture says, but, but if you or your sons at all turn, following me, you turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then let me tell you something. I will cut off Israel from the land, which I have given them. And this house, which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. God tells Solomon that if he or his sons turn away from him, he would bring ruin to the people and to his temple. We must turn our hearts towards God and seek to do his work. We must seek to do God's work. That's important because so many times we focus on what we have to do over here and what we have to do over here. Oh, there's that, there's this. Hold on a minute. What are we doing that is God's work? Well, God desires us to be successful, so he will make us successful in his work. 
You know, it's very interesting. We'll talk about defining success later on when we'll get to that. But it's very, very important. Well, then we read from verse 8. It says here, And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? And then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have embraced other gods, and worshipped them and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all of this calamity upon them. Now we, we said this for a very important reason. God will allow calamity to come on his house if his people reject him. God will allow calamity to come on his house if his people reject him. Let us not allow the attitudes of the world to seep into our hearts, seep into our worship, seep into the way we serve God. That's why we read the Bible every day. And beloved, may I say today that the more we read the word of God, the more we understand what he desires from us. A lot of people read the word of God quickly and they say, well, it says that, it says that. But wait a minute. When we read it carefully, we say, well, it says that, but what it means. What does it mean by what it says? We have to determine that through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we come to Christ and allow God to work in us, we say, Lord, what does this mean? Help me to change my life according to what your word says. Because that's important. We don't need to be just quoting God's word for what it says. We need to quote God's word for what it means. And that's the challenge I have for you today. That's the challenge I have for all of us as we continue reading through the Old Testament. Hi there, Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24 seven. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire. So just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. All right, so 1 Kings chapter 10 describes to us the throne that Solomon had made for himself. And I say it like that because it was quite ostentatious. He was absolutely not trying to be humble in the slightest. He was trying to make a statement about his wealth and about his capability as a king, which to be honest, I don't think he could really take credit for because not only did David establish the peace that Solomon was, you know, resting in and, and ruling on, but God also established the throne of Solomon, which Solomon knew. But nevertheless, this is what 1 King 10, 1 Kings 10 tells us about the throne Solomon had commissioned for himself. Verse 18 and 19 say this, the king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with the finest gold. The throne had six steps and the throne had a round top and on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions standing beside the armrests. And then verse 20 says, while 12 lions stood there, one on each end of a step of these six steps, the like of it was never made in any kingdom. All right. Well, the symbolism of the, the symbolism of the lion really does still last till today. We still say, you know, the lion, the king of the jungle, right? The king of creation, that kind of thing. But let's take a look at what lions meant in the ancient Near East that Solomon was a part of. The lion was one of the main predators of ancient Israel and is mentioned often in the Bible. Today, the wild Asiatic lion is extinct in Israel, though a modern cousin lives in captivity thanks to conservation efforts. From references in the Bible, we know the lion once could be found throughout the land of Israel, regardless of topography. They were considered one of the animals that shepherds had to protect their herds and flocks from. Even David, before he was king, claimed to have defeated lions attacking his sheep. Lions are also said to have occasionally attacked humans. It's an interesting correlation that just as the role of shepherd was associated with kings, so was the lion. 
As shepherd of the people, it was the king's job to establish and maintain order and safety for his flock, protecting them from predators and dangers, and providing them with sustenance. On the surface, the mighty and terrifying lion also provides an apt symbol for the power, strength, and persistence of a good king. As king of the wild, the lion fears only man. As king of his nation, the ruler fears only God, or the gods, depending on his culture. The lion's association with kingship may reach even deeper, as expressed by Neo-Assyrian culture. Their empire was the one that destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and severely humbled southern Judah. On the walls of excavated Assyrian palaces are carvings that depict royal lion hunts, and explanations of these hunts seem to move them beyond sport and into ceremony. The Assyrian kings believed they had a mandate from the gods to bring nature or the wild under control, to civilize even the wildlife. The lion served as the symbol for all this untamed chaos. By successfully hunting a lion, likely as part of their coronation, Assyrian kings took the place of the lion as king of the untamed world. They would not only protect their citizens from the wild, but actively had power over it. The lion's kingly association is more ancient than the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Kingly lion hunting scenes survive from the third millennia BC kingdom of Uruk, as well as from Egypt, and lion imagery adorns a king's mace head from Kish. In the Bible, King Solomon's throne was reached by six stairs flanked by a total of 12 lion statues, perhaps symbolizing the mighty king-like power of the 12 tribes of Israel, ruled over by the ultimate king, himself. At least in that early time of kings, it was a mighty thing to kill a lion, as seen by David's claim to have defeated them, one of his mighty men claiming the same, and of course the famous story of the judge Samson killing a young aggressive lion with his bare hands. It's not known if Israelite kings ever participated in kingly lion hunts, but it is possible that there were some unlawful lion cults or ceremonies that took place. This is hinted at by lion-shaped cult objects and by a lion bone found in northern Israel's apostate high place. So when we look at ancient symbolism this way, I think it 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 puts it puts why the the why back into why Solomon would have wanted lions associated with his throne, specifically subservient lions. And he was he was really not somebody who was humble. No, uh, I mean Solomon really knew that he was great, and he planned on telling everybody. It's really yeah. interesting. And you know what? I feel like he would have been fine if he had not forgotten that what he what he wrote that the that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. He forgot uh -huh. the beginning of his wisdom. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's it's really true. Very good, good, Corey Ryan. All right. Well, for the last few days, we've been reading about King Solomon, and we've been talking a lot about him. And to go along with this, I'd like to take a close up look at his life. He was said to be the wisest man on earth, and though he had a very promising beginning. All the marriages and alliances he made with hundreds of pagan women eventually turned his heart away from the one true God. Check it out. King Solomon was the second son of David and Bathsheba and the third king of Israel. His rise to the throne, however, was by no means without controversy. Indeed, Adonijah, the oldest son of David, presumed himself to be king. However, based on an earlier promise to Bathsheba, David, while on his deathbed, transferred the throne to Solomon instead. Although Solomon was quick to make some very significant political decisions, he was barely out of his teens when he became king and felt inadequate for the job. He says to God in 1 Kings 3.7, I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. It was after Solomon sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord at Gibeon that God came to him in a dream by night and offered the young king anything he desired. Solomon, of course, requests a wise and understanding heart, that he may judge God's people. This request pleases the Lord, and so he grants Solomon this and more. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Kings 4 that Solomon was wiser than all men, and that he spoke 3,000 proverbs and composed 1,005 songs. Solomon's fame quickly spread to the surrounding nations, and many, including the renowned Queen of Sheba, would come from great distances to consult with him and to benefit from his vast knowledge. 
Solomon's 40-year reign was so successful that it is considered to be Israel's golden age, a time of great peace and prosperity, even extending to the surrounding pagan nations. Indeed, Israel was never bigger or richer than it was during Solomon's day. He also did not have to fight any major battles. He controlled the land from Egypt's border in the south to the Euphrates River in what is now northern Syria, more than 200 miles beyond Damascus. His kingdom stretched eastward from the Mediterranean Sea to deep within what is now Jordan. One of the major highlights of Solomon's career was the building of the temple. Although only about the size of a small church, the king spared no expense as the exterior was made of limestone and the interior of cedar wood overlain with gold. Although Solomon started off well and became extremely wise, wealthy, and prosperous by serving the one true God, he was eventually led astray by his 700 wives and 300 concubines to serve foreign gods. Some believe that Ecclesiastes, often attributed to him, gives a glimpse into why he did this. In chapter 2, verses 1 and 3, the preacher says, I said to myself, come now, let's give pleasure a try. While still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In the end, however, Solomon realized that it was all utterly meaningless. Sadly, the king died before his 60th birthday, apparently old before his time, perhaps a result of far too many women to contend with. So let's take King Solomon's life as an example. Although he multiplied wives largely for the purpose of political alliances, this went against God's command. And just as the Lord predicted, his many wives did turn his heart away from the one true God to serve false gods. So let's not allow our own hearts to be turned away as Solomon's was. Yeah, we should, we should read the Bible and stay close to God, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. That's what we should do. Very good. Thank you. Okay, Jen? That's exactly where I was going today, too, talking about the cornerstone of which we know as Christians is Jesus Christ our Lord, the cornerstone. And we see here, as we've already heard uh, several times here, 1 Kings chapter 9, it's God's second appearance to Solomon. And he talks to him about um, having Solomon on the throne and the requirements of that for Solomon and for his sons, that they had to live rightly before God. And we can read about that in 1 Kings 9, 4 through 6. But the other passage that I want to look at in 1 Kings 9 is verses 8 and 9, the scripture about God's house. Um, let's see what it says here. And as for this house, which is exalted, this is God speaking, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Verse 9 says, Then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have embraced other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. It's such a, it's such a stark reminder, isn't it? everybody sitting at this table, of our responsibility as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to keep our lives in alignment with Him. And of course, we're not perfect people, and, and we, we won't be perfect until we're at home with the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we commit to follow the Lord Jesus Christ with our lives, that's what we're doing. We're, follow, we're, we're committing to follow after him and his ways, not for him to adopt what we think, but what God tells us in his word. And this is what Solomon had to do. And there are some people that have the attitude of, well, if I, if I become a Christian and I give my life to the Lord, I'll just make a room for him in here somewhere. And then, you know, I can do what I want. I can live how I want and God will just forgive me if I just, and that is really taking the grace of God and, and, and stomping all over it. So I think, um, we, we need, to, we can look at really amazing passages in, in first Peter. I mean, the, the, the New Testament is full. And if, and if any of you have any other thoughts that you want to add to this, you, you certainly can. And you at home, I'm sure as I'm talking about it, you're thinking of scriptures that point to how we need to live our lives, how that we are a, a reflection, how we are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ to the people that are around us. And, and our responsibility, not only to live for the Lord, but 
But how we live and how we talk and how we respond is a reflection of drawing people to Christ, how that God has changed us and is changing us as we grow following him. First Peter, uh, the first couple of chapters really gives us some good indications of, of how we should live, living before God, our Father. It says here in verse 13, Peter is uh, talking to, to people who have committed their lives to Christ. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, he says, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is, that is to be bought, brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. It goes on to talk about Christ as the stone, the chosen stone, the cornerstone, and his chosen people, and how we need to be living our lives as that testimony. Let's not be the house that we see crumble down that people say, what has happened here? But let us be a house built upon the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is our foundation. This word is our foundation. Let's build our lives upon that rock and move forward in that with our lives. I want to pray today as we focus on God's Word and, and look at it. Father, help us to understand what you mean when you say the things you do. Because Lord, the Bible says something, but we don't just want to read what it says. We want to understand what it means. We understand that your Holy Spirit teaches us that. So Holy Spirit, come into our spirits and help us to read your words the way that you want us to. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. This is what we ask. And we said together, amen.